Okay, let me get started then. So John then asked, John and David asked me to come and give you a little bit of an overview on um, models of imperfect information. Uh, and so the approach I took is in a sense, I, I took this challenge a little bit differently from Mark Burton before in that he gave you a very specific use of how these models have been used for a question quantity of easing. I'm going to give you a much more of a bird's eye view of what the literature has been. Um, and then I, I and then show you some applications to the crisis. Um, and we can also leave more concrete questions to the to the Q&A part. So there's been really a lot of work on imperfect information in the last 15 years in macro. And um, on the one hand, imperfect information is certainly not a new idea. You can go way back into the 19th century to, to see a lot of uh, concerns about imperfect information. But at the same time, there has been there were some clearly new elements in this research, not just relative to 100 years ago, but especially relative to say 20 years ago. Um, when these models were being written in the late 70s or, late, or early 80s. And so I, I would say that there's really been five elements in this resurgence of interest. And then the first one is that these models have put a big emphasis on strategic interactions. Whereas if you looked at the generation of models following the Lucas Island models, they were very much about individual agents trying to infer things about the world by themselves. In this new class of models, it's very much about how do I infer things about the world knowing that all of you are trying to infer things about the world and thinking about the equilibrium that arises from there in an explicit game-theoretic sense um, and where things like strategic complementarity, tools that only showed up 20 years ago, like strategic complementarities, become crucial. Likewise, and related, a second element was that the early 1970s Lucas literature kind of died off with this very important thing by Rob Townsend and the forecast of others. They realized that once you start thinking about imperfect information with many agents, then you very quickly realize you have to solve not just for what I think about the world, but also for what I think that you think about the world, and what I think that you think that you think. And we really didn't have a way to handle that, so it essentially meant that the models were intractable. But then the development of global games and our much better understanding of what common knowledge is, as well as what higher order expectations mean, the development that happened in the game theory literature independently of these macro concerns, meant that we all of a sudden had the tools to actually solve for these forecasts of others. And that was a very, very important part of why this literature reemerged. A third point is more semantic and yet I think proved crucial, which was to focus on attention. Um, in the world of Google, it's very hard to talk about imperfect information because of some cost of acquiring information. You can't just write a Lucas Island model because I can just open Google and figure out exactly what the money supply is in the UK right now in approximately the 32nd. And so just to say that I don't know what the money supply is, it's just can't fly nowadays. Much more important, <laughs> we think today are not the costs of acquiring information, but are what, what I called, maybe most of this issue, the cost of absorbing and processing information. That is, uh, figuring out from all the data out there, what is the relevant state of the world, what's the relevant summary statistic, you may call them in plain English, interpreting the information, and then the cost of processing information, that is of mapping then that state into your actions, the cost of figuring out what's the best thing to do given that. And that is gone into the heading instead of attention, that is, not that it's not hard to figure out the money supply in Google, but, that you, but that if you're trying to figure out how much should you save or spend or whether you should buy more stocks or not, then there's just a lot of information out there and that it does take mental and financial resources to summarize that, to figure out what's the relevant part of information and exactly what should you decide based on that. And that literature has gone under the heading, big heading of inattentiveness or rational inattention to capture precisely that process. A fourth one is that this is a literature where people choose to learn. So it's not, again, a difficulty with the literature, especially in the eight, early 80s, the literature that died of imperfect information, had to do with us realizing in, these, in models, if you just say that I observe some things and not something else, but as a theorist, I have a lot of freedom to do that, then I can kind of explain a lot of things in a negative way, meaning it starts becoming hard to reject theories. Um, and so you have to add some discipline in terms of exactly what do people know and not know. And the discipline that the literature was brought is to make that a choice variable. That is to figure out when do people choose to learn. People seem to, figure, try, people seem to pay a lot of attention to their income around tax season, when they have to declare their income and figure out exactly how much they made. Uh, what to learn, that is what things to pay attention to and which ones to ignore. And in particular, many people focus a lot on, or people in this room focus a lot on their lecture notes, but many people but probably don't focus too much uh, on what's happening with the new rule, what's happening in equity markets with the new rules of pensions in terms of how you should be changing your uh, savings for retirement. And then where to learn, that is where to get your information from a newspaper, from your friends, and other, or other places. Fifth and last, the research had to do with the fact that the literature turned to direct data. Um, 
there were people working on inverse information throughout. You had Vincent Seppo and Poyo's work on uh, Lewis Square's learning and a very large literature on that. You had imperfect common knowledge within the work of Roman Friedman and others. Uh, we had agent based learning on that. So, Roger Guénery and inductive learning. So, there were imperfect information. So, in a sense, we do have a little bit of an abundance of theories. But one thing that the more recent literature has emphasized is that we have survey data on what people believe, and that can allow us to actually make these models more quantitative, to distinguish between models, and to test these models more seriously so that we don't use beliefs and information as a free variable that the theorists can control to explain whatever you feel about. Okay? So I will give you a feeling of, the, of why all of these elements contribute to the development of the literature in a simple framework. I'm not, I'm, I put here a lot of names of people that have been involved there with arbitrarily putting just a name of one person in each of the headings, even though many people work in many. From now on, I will not refer to anyone or give you any references. Please email me if you want them, just for the sake of keeping the slides brief. But everything that I say, 90% of what I say comes, or not 90, a, fra a large fraction of what I'll say is not from papers by me, but it will be my interpretation of them, and I should give credit out. Okay, so let me tell you how this, how is the modern new literature information choice. Um, it boils down essentially to one model or one simple setup. Um, there's going to be a set of agents that in red sol are solving what is a very conventional, again, going back 20 years, imperfect information problem choosing their action. They're choosing some action, I'm gonna call that P for policy function, okay, to maximize expected utility, and where their utility function depends on their action, but also on some uncertainty in the world, a state variable S, and here you see the strategic interactions, everyone else's action. Okay, so very importantly, what everyone else is doing, which I'm gonna note just by P bar. It could be a big vector of each of the variables and aggregate it. The imperfect information comes because you only have, you have to integrate over the state of the world. You don't know what the state of the world is today. That's the integral and in what you integrate over. In this literature, though, you have a signal, and those signals are going to be called Z. That is, your distribution function on what's going on in the world is not just what nature gives you, f of s, but it's the f of s conditional on Z. That is, it's a conditional distribution on the signal that you've obtained. And therefore, you're choosing your actions based on your signal Z that you receive. The information choice then comes with H. That is, that you are choosing the distribution of these signals. How do these signals get drawn? So this distribution function, this probability density function, is a choice variable. This is the choice of information. This is the choice of attention. And you choose it, but the two important things that you have to do is from a set, H, and therefore you have to define what that set is, and obviously that must be a cost so that you don't just observe to get you observe the perfect signal. Okay? In equilibrium, then, you add that the aggregate actions are some aggregator of the actions that are everyone else, the vector P, and this defines essentially the equilibrium game. And it's a, really almost all models of information of, of the literature that I'll be serving fit into this very general framework. Okay? Note that this, unlike full information of last expectations or even Bayesian, Bayesian rational expectations models, here you choose where your information is coming from. Okay? So this is a very behavioral theory. It's a theory where people observe less than what's out there. While at the same time, unlike, say, least first learning or agent-based learning, it's a very classical theory. Why? Because it's couched in terms of constraint optimization. Okay? So it's a literature that's trying to, in a sense, keep the tools of economics, the main tool of economics of the last 50 years, constraint optimization, okay? while at the same time leave with big deviation from the rational expectations break. Okay? So how has progress happened? First, what's this right cost function? A lot is going to determine on what, what this thing is. And so there have been two big insights in this literature. One is that there probably is a fixed cost of observing something. There's just information requires setting up a structure to think about it. Okay? It's very hard to do information. You don't work a minute a day on your papers. You have to just put a block of time to first figure out what you're doing before you on any paper. And that fixed cost immediately means that you're going to have inattentiveness. That is that at this point, you guys are focusing on me, you're not paying attention to your papers. You're not paying attention to what's happening in the stock market right now, and now you should change your allocation of savings or portfolio. Okay? There's going to be inattentiveness. You literally are not paying attention to the stock market right now. Put down your phone. <laughs> Those who are. Okay? So that's the first insight, and therefore you're always going to have these inact what is inaction in fixed cost models here is inattentiveness. A second is that we can, we have, we can borrow from, um, from uh, Claude Shannon this very important result that under some axioms, which I put here, a good measure of information, of uncertainty, is entropy. And entropy is written here. It turns out to be this formula. 
which has a very natural feeling for orthogonals because it's just a representation theorem. In the same way that derived expected utility out of some axioms, you write some axioms which seem kind of plausible on a measure information, and you end up with entropy. And so what Shannon's insight was, and what the Slitchers exploited, and this I strongly recommend for you this pop science book called The Information by James Blight that tells you how the Shannon insight has actually been part of the DNA revolution, has been part of why we have the internet. Every science but economics up until 10 years ago has essentially been revolutionized by this idea of Shannon. And so economists have caught on, well, we're well, doing we this in macro now. And the idea is that I have some uncertainty on the world, H of S. Now I've given you a signal, Z, that uncertainty has fallen. And therefore, this difference is going to tell me how much my uncertainty has fallen. And we can think about our brain the same way that we think about an internet modem or any other source of information. Again, a lot, there was a lot of fun work in the 40s about the, how many bits are in a Bible and things like that, or in any book. Uh, you can think about that cosmos idea is how much can you lower your uncertainty on this thing by observing the signal. Okay? And the wonderful thing about this is that it gives you, whereas this was about the fix, this gives you the marginal cost of information. That is, it tells, it gives me an answer to that difficult question in information problems of, I can either listen to you or read a book. What's the relative cost of these things? It's just different activities. Kind of hard to put a dollar in them. And you can think of it in terms of, well, they each allow me to reduce my information by a certain amount. I can quantify both of the measures in terms of the probability distributions, and therefore talk meaningfully about how much more costly it is to read a book versus listen to you in terms of how many how much did it allow me to reduce uncertainty? Okay. Second was a focus on this F, S, Z, H, Z, that is on the joint distribution of S and Z, signals and the, and the, and the information. And here, people start, we started looking at um, expectation surveys, and people have been looking at that, but in some ways that work had been ignoring the wealth of that data by focusing on the median or the mean forecast from professionals, from households, and checking whether there was full information as expectations. And overwhelmingly, pretty much every single paper finds that you don't. Uh, and if you don't reject that null, it's basically because your sample isn't big enough. As soon as you add a little, few more data points, you always reject it. And that was, a, anyway, we figured that out. But what can you do more that's more constructive with this? And what did this literature do? Was to say, well, you have this whole distribution. Let's start looking at things like the second moment. Well, the whole distribution in principle, but at least let's start with the second moment. There's disagreement. And the insight here is that disagreement is not uncertainty. Yes, an increase in uncertainty may lead to disagreement, but that is neither necessary nor sufficient. And the situation is all about the fact that sometimes there may be no change in uncertainty, but some people start learning more about some things and others learn about something else, and we start disagreement more. And this literature, because it's about when you choose those attention, gives an endogenous movement of disagreement that's completely orthogonal, it's not really orthogonal, but that's different from uncertainty. Uncertainty does not lead to the disagreement. And so you have some wonderful things like this is the Distribution of inflation expectations in the Michigan survey of households around Volcker. And you see that they started high and they end up low as Volcker comes in and lowers inflation. But the dynamics of this are such that A, the shift is gradual, and it happens as mass moves from the right to the left, including some bimodality. With a strong hint that by 1983 or 4, some people had figured out we're in a new regime, inflation is now going to be around 2-3%, and others were still stuck with inflation is around 7-8%, and you see this and you can use this very powerfully to test models of whether do we, these models generate this bimodality and this, and this gradual shift of the distribution of expectations. Okay? Likewise, on forecast errors, these models make very precise predictions on what happens to the forecast error after some shock. Here's data on consumer firms, FOMC members, because we have their forecasts. Here's a shock at technology shock. So we know a technology shock in an imperfect information model, again, comes with a strong restriction, which is you have, if something new happens, technology goes up, say, and that tends to lower inflation, all of these models mean that you react too little. You're not quite sure if it's really a shock or if nothing happened. Okay? Therefore, they predict you would have a negative forecast error. You lowered your inflation expectations, but not as much as how much it happened. You, we see then the data, this is a test of that prediction. And moreover, that all imperfect information theories, or almost all of this class, will predict no hump shapes, but a convergence towards zero. Neither crossing the horizontal line, neither getting a hump shape. It's just the way Bayes' rule works. And here you have a big confirmation of Bayes' rule in these predictions. All of these things kind of go to zero and converge to it. Okay? In black is the model, by the way, and these things are the complex intervals around. Okay. Uh, lab, we've started just doing that. Let me skip that. Give me some time. Third, another big insight. The information is a theory of random choice. Okay? Why? You can think about me choosing actions and signals to 
affect this, and affect this distribution. Or you can realize that there's a one-to-one -one map between my signal and my action. If I observe red, I move left. If I observe green, I move right. But given that I have an imperfect signal, on what I, well, so I can invert that map, and given that my signal is stochastic related to the state of the world, that means that ultimately what I am is behaving randomly given the state of the world. Why? Because I got a random signal that affected my action. That is that the problem can be equivalently written, which is, well, which is what I did here, as I'm actually choosing my random behavior given the state of the world. Where again, the story is, why do I have random behavior given the state of the world? Because I get a random signal on the state of the world that leads me to choose then a deterministic action. And so why is this useful? Because overwhelming evidence, behavioral, experimental, administrative, whatever, any source, that you give people a choice between red apple, green apple, and we just observe that people switch. They don't, you give that choice 100 times, try to control it, and they don't choose 100 times the red instead of the green apple. They do seem to alternate a little bit between them. This is the whole random choice theory, again, uh, of loose enough. Okay? And this theory gives, a, gives you a reason for that. Gives you a reason that has to do not with random utility models, which has been the McFadden story for how you observe random choice, but instead because you get an imperfect signal of whether the apple turned out to be red or green. Okay? Um, so for instance, the multinomial logic model, which I wrote here, which has been applied to probably the most common model of discrete choice in the literature, can be shown to be exactly derived as a reduced form of an imperfect information of and attention model. It's actually, if you have normal priors and you're facing a discrete choice problem, this is exactly what you get. So we have a microfoundation for the most dominant model of demand in the discrete choice, just from these theories. Similarly, here is, from again these theories, um, um, infrequent price adjustment. So here is the deviation of your price from the optimum on the horizontal axis, and here's the probability that you will adjust your price. So the, the state-dependent model that some of you have seen is these blue lines. If you're far away from your optimum, then you choose to adjust. There's zero mass over here, and you essentially have the probability of one once you hit these points only. Calvo-type models of price adjustment are the horizontal line. You adjust with 30% probability regardless of what's going on in the world. What do these new imperfect information theory give you? Focus on the green line. The other lines are just for different amounts of information. That A, you get this fact, which is overwhelming the data, that even people that are at the right price or very close to it still adjust their prices. Why would they pay the fixed cost of that? So, well, because they're not sure. They, only after they pay this cost do they know that they were actually turned out to be close and they shouldn't have paid it. So, you have a positive probability here, which is what the other theories have trouble. Second, you have this increasing probability. The further you are, doesn't mean that you're going to jump and suddenly adjust. It means that it's more likely that you'll look at it and choose to adjust. And third, you have the skewness, that you respond a lot more to being having a price that's too low than having a price that's too high. All these facts have been puzzles in the state adjustment literature, and they're very easily explained in information. Okay. Fourth, what is the right structure for the agents has been in the other literature? Well, we've figured out the linear quadratic Gaussian case. Um, that is when the world is linear, your objective is quadratic, the, the world is normal. And two insights came of that. One, you pay a lot more attention to your life rather than to what Ben Bernanke is saying. There's many reasons for that. Uh, second, core solutions are common. It's, it's actually very easy and mysterious to get that you pay no attention to Ben Bernanke, which I think corresponds to most households outside this room. <laughs> With non-quadratic objectives, you have this fun, these interesting results that you get discreteness. That is, whereas the world is continuous, or probably is continuous in many ways, it is actually optimal information in sense to behave discreetly. Here in green is what would be your optimal, say, price. This is for a monopolist. And in blue is what's the optimal choices of a guy with imperfect information. He chooses three prices, regular price, safe price, ripoff customer price. <laughs> and it's exactly that that's optimal. This is very hard. There's very few theories that will tell you why is it that the world is continuous and yet you only take three steps. We all understand this intuitively. We denominate prices in cents, in pennies, sorry, wrong country. We denominate prices in pennies. Why not in 0 0.99999 pounds? Well, we understand intuitively this is the same information. Once I'm at 0.99, that's pretty close uh, to how much it costs to buy this apple or this banana. More generally, though, we observe that firms save a tremendous amount of information, even though there's big stakes. They only choose two or three prices. How could that be that? Well, we can show that that's essentially a an optimal information saving strategy. I keep in mind that I have a price, I have a sales price, I have a ripoff person price, and I'm going to alter between those and it's in randomized between them that's all of marketing, but choosing only three prices is the optimal information strategy. Okay. 
um, when to plan. So then we turn this model dynamic and it becomes about when. So let me tell you one thing there. So here's a fun example. So this is a switch to digital TV. Okay? That's going on in the UK right now. The Northeast, I think, does that in Northern Ireland does it in a month. In the US, it happened a couple of years ago. And so this is what it happened in the US in 2003. Um, so this is basically, you. most people like to watch TV. If you don't pay attention to the fact that you need to get this little machine or buy a new TV, your TV is going to stop working at the date where they switch off the aerial signal and it turns digital. Here are Google searches for digital TV or digital TV transition. Okay? The US is going to change at this date. Oh, I forgot the date, but it's basically around here. Okay, initially, I forget the date. It was February someday. Okay? What do you see with Google searches, which these models predict of when you allocate attention? You pay no attention to digital TV before. It's far away. You don't care. You discount it. Then you start increasing gradually. The theory actually predicts that it should be convex. I don't know how this is abusing the data, but it kind of looks convex. And then it's kind of peaking just before the change. And that's exactly the awful thing to do. Why? Because now it's very close. What happened then in the US was that Obama said, uh, I think people aren't ready and need renege. So he said, actually, we're going to change it only in six months, in five months. Okay? What does the theory predict? I actually hear a simulation of a model. Present now, most people have figured out or many have. Obama's worried about the ones that didn't, but many have. What should I see about Google searches the day after? Even though this has been in the news, Obama's been on the news and said digital TV. Many of you naively may have said, oh, digital TV is going to be a lot of Google searches. Theory says, no. Nobody's going to care the next day. Nobody cares the next day. Nobody searches now, and now only when you get to the actual switch, and now only one week later, because now it's only the guys who are left over. They, which are already waiting for the last minute, are again going to wait for the last minute, and then they're going to search a lot and then finally learn about it. So the series telling us about something about what Obama should have done and how does it affect? What, what's the awful time to make this announcement? Um, other, a lot of work also on markets then. Given this, when should you make these announcements? But in the interest of time, let me stop on property. How much time do I have? We've got uh, seven minutes. Perfect. So now John had put this challenge, he sent a lot of questions on things that, how can I use this theory to understand the crisis? So let me tell you some things that these kind of theories can tell me about the crisis. First question, I'm going to put some questions. Why is it that the securities markets became so toxic? Or why did you have all these MBSs that everyone thinks were worthless and yet were resold? Here I find very instructive um, the simple table from Barry Wright, Chris Foote, and Paul Willen, and Chris Girardi. Uh, this was Lehman Brothers. Um, they surveyed their traders, or they had a survey of the traders, or they gave them some probabilities on what was going to happen to house price. So that's HPA, it's going to change to the house price index. And how much would be the loss in the portfolio of their MBSs if, if that scenario happened. Okay. So whether you thought that you're going to have 11% over the life of the pool of mortgages that they were trading, the MBSs, appreciation, it was called aggressive. Meltdown, the worst scenario, which was they're going to fall by 5% house prices. And then five after is better than what happened in reality. This is the worst meltdown. The world's going to end. And they gave it 5% probability. What's remarkable is that these numbers here, the loss that would have happened in these scenarios, are incredibly accurate. So the story that says MBS were too complicated and nobody could price them is not at all confirmed by this data. These guys knew exactly how much this was worth. The problem was they put a probability of essentially less than 5% of something really bad happening. But the problem in the LBS market, these guys have been arguing, I think very persuasively, I strongly encourage you to read all of their work. There was no problem in terms of complexity or not understanding what was going on. It was really the problem of information. We just put an extremely low probability on something that was possible. And this theory, I kind of skipped that, but this, this series of information tells exactly that. It was very unlikely that this would happen. It hadn't happened before. But more importantly, it was one of these rare events um, that for which you had a bunch of prior uncertainty because you didn't know how the government would react, um, and for which it was actually optimal to not pay attention in, this, in the guise of this theory. So it was optimal to think that these problems were too low. Moreover, insofar as you shop for ratings, and different ratings agencies are going to be giving you some um, different ratings, then insofar as there's the shopping, and you're getting every agency rating is giving you an unbiased rating of what they think the quality of the pool is, and so far as you can shop, you can pick the max. And in picking the max, lower the amount of information out there in the data. So that even though you have ratings that are unbiased and allow you to price things well, your information, your assessment of the probability of these scenarios, because you've picked the issuer of the, of the security, picked the rosier one, may turn out to have been very, very bad. Okay. Why do financial crises arise? 
big question. So let me tell you some insights from your information. Here's a key lesson that's come out of these models. Imagine that I know a little bit more about one security instead of other. I just happen to start knowing a little bit more about UK stocks than German stocks because I live in the UK. Then I'm going to, my portfolio would be slightly tilted toward German, or towards UK, or UK securities. But once it's slightly tilted towards there, I look at my incentive to acquire information on UK and Germany, and I want to obtain more information on UK securities. But the more information I have on UK securities, the safer they look in terms of my perceived risk, which is that I want to acquire more of them. That is, information actually interacts with portfolio choice to create a very powerful multiplier and to lead you to actually want to go towards core solutions with very strong home bias. Because the more I know about something, the more I'm going to invest, and the more I'm going to invest, the more I want to know about it. So when we ask where, why were um, people so, let, so little diversified in taking excessive risk, well, that if you know something well, that's where you want to put your eggs. Okay? This then means that you also get contagion. So let me just mention one in terms of time. Um, you know, the contagion can come simply because you're holding a portfolio, you see bad things happen in your portfolio, you don't know if it came because of this or that market, you lower exposure to all markets, there will be one not, not so interesting way. But the second more interesting is, imagine you have a big increase in uncertainty about Greek bonds. Okay. Then what are you going to do? Well, this high increase in uncertainty means that I want to shift more attention to Greek bonds. If that's a big increase, I need to figure out. I need to spend some time. If I'm an investment bank, I need to put some more workers, think about this attention, learning about Greece. But more guys learning about Greece is less guys learning about everywhere else. So my uncertainty on everywhere else has just gone up. Just because I have paid less, I'm paying less attention to them. And so I get contagion via increasing uncertainty. So it's not just contagion in terms of prices fall, but uncertainty goes up everywhere, spreads everywhere, because of the allocation of attention. Why such um, much borrowing? Um, again, um, let me skip the first, let me tell you, again, interest of time, more, I think the more interesting point. Um, why do we have so many people that, don't, that borrow, that have no savings? And then we get to these prices and they get a bad income shock, Unemployment goes up, or they lose value in their houses, and they're in dire straits, and then we, we have to do something about it. Okay? Well, it turns out that that could be optimal in the following sense. Imagine that I have relatively high cost of planning in the consumption problem, right? Then I'm going to be attentive for a little bit. That is, I'm not going to be paying every day attention because I'm only going to pay attention every so often. Because I have better things to do, because I'm not educated enough, because I just find it very cost to figure out how to invest my savings. But the longer I spend to get the information, it means that the more by the time I adjust, I'm going to have a permanent, the permanent income shocks left and the transitory gone. That's the definition of them being permanent. But what's the optimal Friedman, react, Friedman permanent hypothesis reaction to permanent shocks? Is C equals Y, a marginal price of consumer of 1. Therefore, actually in these models, it's optimal to live hand-to-mouth if you have high cost of planning. If you're going to react very frequently, if you don't really know what you're doing, C equals Y or a version of that, Set, eat whatever you get, is a way to save a lot on your information costs. And that, especially if the government provides you a safety net, it turns out not to be too costly on welfare. Okay? How much time do I have? About a minute. A minute, okay. okay. So I'm going to skip what, these models very quick, very easily give you sharp recessions and slow recoveries. Why? Because of the fact that information has a fixed cost. So when everything is going well, some guy, we've paid the fixed cost, that's being spread by everyone. Because it's being spread by everyone, the cost for each person of information is low. We're all get, getting into frenzies and getting into assets. As soon as we have some small shocks, the fixed cost becomes too large to learn about things, and then everybody gets out of the market. So we can get very quickly that the markets collapse as we switch out the shift costs. But I want to, just to relate to the previous presentation, talk about forward guidance. Um, and so central banks now, with interest rates at zero, have either been doing quantitative easing or more generally talking about making statements, giving forward guidance. So Mark, Gertler, or I've seen Simon, Simon's first slide, as they said, my foot for things that should be more forward guidance, whereas Mark Gertler's was more, do more quantitative type of measures. But I think it's fair to say that the forward guidance has not been too effective. I mean, you keep on committing, and then you may say maybe it's because they haven't spoken enough, or they haven't spoken clearly enough, or credibly enough. But the fact is that you don't see inflation expectations shifting as much as the announcements and the promises of future inflation by the policymakers. Okay? Why? Okay. Well, one of these models, again, insofar as you make an announcement of what you're going to do five years from now, people discount that. They're not going to pay too much attention to what's five years down the line. That's the less interesting one. Here's the more interesting in terms of economic effects here. The more you're speaking, when you speak one, when Bernanke would give one statement, Jackson Hole, once a year, everybody listens to that statement. Everybody's trying to figure out what everyone else is doing. 
And, special, and that requires figuring out what everyone else knows. There was this clear point of commonality that meant that if I want to know what others know, I need to listen to Bernanke once a year. Once you start making statements very often, while you're increasing total information, you're saying a lot more things, you're also reducing commonality. Because now some people saw one or interpreted one way, some people saw another. So as you make more statements, you may actually find that you're being ignored more often precisely because I'm partly listening to you so that I know what others know. And now the odds that someone else will be listening to you are, larger, are lower. Okay. And so you have the four guidance actually, you have very little kick of making more statements, of, be, of making more statements, because while um, you're revealing more information, you're lowering the amount of commonality, and we can actually come up with cases where the overall information out there in the world could fall. What you have to focus on is that it gives you more precise information, not more information per se. So, bottom line in my minus 30 seconds, um, you know, this, it's not, I, the reason why I did put all these names up here, beyond the fact, given that I had already gone and been completely unfair and outside anyone's work, is that these are a lot of people that are out there and they're publishing in good journals, they're getting good jobs. So the view that you're persecuted for your information is completely outdated. This, this, this is a well-established field of macro. People work on this. Um, I've shown you some of what they've learned. Information has peculiar characteristics. It has a fixed cost. I've told you the complementarity of portfolio choices and actions. I've told you about how people desire commonality. They desire coordination. The fact that information can be ignored, these, common, these corner solutions, you can just not pay attention. All of those mean that there's a lot of interesting economic insights, and I've tried to give you some. And we have data to test these towards new, new, new benchmarks. Okay, that was it. Thank you.